So I seen this headline on Inc. and it says, Elon Musk's management device is so brilliant that I threw away 37 business books. Uh, but I'm going to title this video, Never Do Anything That Would Make a Great Dilbert Cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> So me and Brett have both spent some time in the corporate world, and uh, we can tell you that Dilbert is spot on way too many times. And so we figured we'd discuss this, and I'm going to talk about, I mean, that's a great clickbait headline, uh, maybe for both of us, a Don't right. Make a Dilbert Cartoon. Uh, but we're actually going to run through the list of some of Elon's uh, advice, but why are we even doing this at all? And this is a business talk. If you didn't guess already, this is not a tech review, but it's hugely important if you run a business that you set the tone for the culture. This mm -hmm. is, uh, it, it, you know, I can't express really how important culture and methodologies play in business and will impact your success. Too many people get hung up on what technology I should use, what uh, should I deploy in my network, and all that fun stuff that concerns IT companies. But yeah. the reality of it, the culture that gets set is what leads to like famous companies like Equifax. They had such a culture of not getting along um, that they had over a hundred people on a mailing list to say to fix something and no one did it because there was so much infighting. Mm -hmm. If you really dig into the story, it's not about technology and you can point your finger at a technology failure, but there's a culture failure that allowed the technology to fail and that's more related than people want to believe. So let's start running down this list here. I, I we were I was looking at this list before we started and it's it, I got I got caught on the Dilbert um, <laughs> that, that 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 stopped me so go ahead Tom. yeah <laughs> that, that stopped me <laughs> so as you start with the first one it says no large meetings unless they're of value to the entire audience keep them short I, <laughs> no no large meetings you know what's you know what's funny is is I used to work for somebody that that talked about you know I don't want to have meetings to have meetings right um but it never worked out that way because we always had a Friday sales meeting, a Friday recruiting meeting, um, a Monday how's things going meeting, and 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 a meeting on Tuesday, and I and it almost came to a point where you get nothing done because you're doing meetings. Yeah, and I felt this way, you know, when when I had my corporate job, very much so. We had a meeting about a meeting to have another mm -hmm. meeting, and you know, anyone who spent time in corporate has uh, made jokes like that. Uh, my wife had a corporate job for a little while, and they used to say, I, I do like the phrasing they used at the corporate companies you work for. Uh, we cordially, you're cordially obligated, not cordially invited. <laughs> you're cordially obligated to attend these meetings. They uh, they called them well. Internally, they called them the rah rah meetings, right? Uh, because they were all a bunch of get everybody hyped up. And that's what number one's <clears throat> about is the rah rah, the large meeting to yeah. rah rah people, right? I mean, yeah. that's what it seems like to me. And, and I'll segue a little bit to this if you haven't seen this before. <laughs> And I'll leave it. This is the oatmeal, and uh, we have this posted in our office because I want people to really remind of this. This is called multiplicative idiocy <laughs> and the troutification of an idea. And basically the concept is, and I have witnessed this firsthand in too many instances, if you have two half wits in a meeting, you don't get – a full wit, you get a quarter wit. It's multiplicative idiocy. <laughs> and yes. if you want to watch an idea go to die, watch a lot of people with bad ideas. Sit in a the, room. Sit in a room and make the idea worse, you know. And it, <laughs> it's it's really just a funny thing because it, the way it works out is uh, I have an idea and someone goes, I can make that idea worse. And then the third person goes, hold on. I can do QR, it even worse. Yes, QR codes. <laughs> QR <laughs> so, codes. <laughs> I mean, but this is really important. Um, this it, it just dumbs things down, and you don't want too many people in these meetings. This is a mm -hmm. huge, huge problem um, that you face. Well, you realize you're not. So, you, do you need an all hands meeting? And it kind of you know segues into the two. Don't have frequent meetings unless they matter truly urgent. It's kind of the same thing. One and two. Just keep them short. Don't have them if they're, for, if they're urgent. Uh, if you are not adding value to a meeting, walk out and drop off the call. Now, I've done that as a contractor. Uh, right. It's become easier as a contractor when I'm being paid for my time as a consultant, so to speak, because when you're doing that, I can say, hey, I'm not adding any value, but I'm going to bill you for my time. They go, they think about the value. But unfortunately, yes. a lot of companies don't, and they just want these all-hands meetings all the time uh, where they want everyone on a call. And really, if you're sitting in a call in silence and you're not gaining anything from it because it, you know, they're running through every department, uh, we just went through this with a big job we did. They, had, they called it their all-hands Tuesday meeting on this big project. I was driven nuts because of the requirement to be there mm -hmm. but i'm like you guys realize how inefficient this is and i'm uh vocal about that even though i'm paid for the job this is 
it's don't it doesn't hurt to just say I'm going to leave because I'm not adding value and I'm not gaining value. That's as simple a sentence as I say, and then I drop off the call unless someone has a rebuttal of why I'm adding or they can prove why I'm adding or gaining value to that. Well, me having having a meeting and 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 being being a, the worst thing to to, have, to be is in a meeting where you're not going to say a thing. Right. Um, you think about. Um, your billable time, right? You think about the things you do when you do a job. You're you're in, you're billing out for these aspects, and sometimes those meetings it, it's it's wasting the client's money, if anything else, because you're being you're billing out for whatever your hourly rate right. is, whatever my hourly rate is, and 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 I have dropped off meetings and stopped my hourly time because it's it's important for my client to understand that I value that relationship. And I, I, if I'm not going to be able to input or have any input in that meeting, it's not going to be important for me to be there. I love this list. And that, that one yeah. resonated with me because when you, when I've been in, and you've been in meetings where we're sitting there and for an hour and a half and you don't say a word, what were you there for? Well, and, and I'll, I'll note to a time when I was on, I belong to some boards, some charity boards and things like that that I participate mm -hmm. in. And I've uh, witnessed, and this has been very helpful in my career, is watching good leadership run a meeting. So you as a mm -hmm. leader of a meeting, you are the one that called it. Um, in picture, let me set the scene a little bit. Uh, you have a meeting. You have a lot of people who volunteer their time. They're CEOs of other companies. They are uh, that I guess the word is A-type personality, right. and one of the persons there who, uh, I don't know why he said this, but it was to discuss a problem that was occurring um, with a fundraiser, and it's like the the first thing this guy said, his name was Brian, and Brian says, <laughs> I know what the problem is, but I'm not saying anything, and the person running the meeting says, no problem, Brian, can you step outside? And Brian's like, what? But I'm part of this. No, you're not. You just said you don't have anything to say itself. But, and he goes, he took him right out. And he goes, That's anyone great else? leadership. Yeah. And he said, in the guy running the meeting, uh, says, is there anyone else who has no helpful things? You can just leave now. So the those of us that want to solve this problem, not blame and make sarcastic comments, can move. And Brian's kind of wandering out the door. And you have someone who's in charge of a lot of things in it, his uh, day job who's not used to having someone telling him what to do. But... Mm -hmm. Robert's Rules of Order in that meeting and the person running meetings moved him out. But you set that tone right. and you, you, it's one of those things you have to decide. It's a, a sign of good leadership when you set the tone for the rest of the meeting. But this is, you know, invaluable uh, that you do that. It's not that you're being a ass, as I've seen people say it, but sometimes you kind of have to be. That perception may be on there. Right. That's certainly the perception that Brian had, who was asked to leave the meeting, with the rest of us felt respect. We didn't think he was being an ass. We're like, wow, great. Now all of us that really care about solving the problem and not, you know, making those, <laughs> I know what the problem is, but I'm not saying, you know, because we, we actually knew. We knew someone made some mistakes. They spent some money they mm -hmm. shouldn't have. We knew uh, the problem. There was an elephant in the room, so to speak, but we were there to address and solve it. The money was spent. We can't get it back. How are we going to fill this gap and solve mm -hmm. this problem at this fundraiser? You know, these are the type of things that it, it was a meeting that needed to be solved and uh, having only people who are effective and wanted to work towards the goal and not, you know, mm -hmm. blame another person. Huge. Well, it, what, what, why do you have a meeting? What's, what's the purpose of a meeting, Tom? Yeah. Well, to hopefully solve a problem, exactly. have a strong, solid exactly. agenda, uh, skip the platitudes, really mm -hmm. jump right into it. Matter of fact, this person is running a meeting. That's one of the things he does all the time. Skip the platitudes, jumps right into the meeting. Uh, he's there. And he also gave me a great piece of advice. Uh, I've known Ray a long time. And Ray, what did Ray say? He says, the meeting, the meeting's a formality. All the problems are already solved. And he always winked at me like that. He's like, <laughs> the meeting's a formality. So he's already got, he's already talked to all of us. We're already there. So the meeting's anytime I'm, when he was running it, I loved it because it was always short. The meetings already solved. All the problems are solved. The right. meetings are formality to make sure everyone's on the same page. <laughs> exactly. You've already collaborated earlier, and it's it's done. There's at least a good strong idea. This is just to solidify that everyone's on the same page, and and it did. I think the meeting was like 20 minutes. Solved the problem. Everything went well. It's exactly what you want. Let's right. jump to the next one here. Okay. Now this is very relevant to my industry, Elon Musk industry here. Don't use acronyms and nonsense words for object software processes. Avoid <laughs> any terms that require explanation because they inhibit communications. That is huge. Huge. Yeah. Uh, filling the word, filling the world with acronyms. I mean, there may be something very relevant, but absolutely. If, if you have to say it's X, Y, Z, but then explain and expand. Upon what is your, X, Y, Z? And yeah. What is this? You've now only added more <clears throat> syllable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, who's been in a meeting before and had an acronym and didn't know what that acronym was? You've been at this company for a long period of time and they someone rattles off an acronym and you don't want to be the dumb one in the room. 
and, and say, excuse me, can you explain what that is? And you stand there and think for the next five minutes, what is this acronym, until they get to the end of it and then you realize what it is. And during that time, you weren't even thinking of the problem. You were thinking of the acronym. Yeah. It happens. It happens. And no one wants to admit they don't know what they're talking about. What do you right. mean? You know, the XYZ thing. Uh, we all look around. No, no one wants to be that guy that says, oh, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, right. Well, actually, um, it's good if you are, but the general reaction is not to uh, – not to let people know that you don't know. <laughs> right. Well, you, you know, you're getting, usually you're getting paid a lot of money to be in this company or whatever in that meeting. And you don't want to be that person that, why are we paying this guy anyways? He doesn't even know what this is. Right. But in, in reality is you may be the problem if you're the one bringing up everything as an acronym that you aren't mm -hmm. absolutely confident they understand it. Um, and this is, you know, when I worked in uh, corporate, I mean, I worked at head of IT, but I had to pitch to the board, to the management teams, why they needed to spend money on a firewall, security, or any of those mm -hmm. things. This is, if I just threw a bunch of acronyms out there, that doesn't help the meeting at all. It's about showing the value that these things create. It's still a sales pitch, but just you don't want to just try to talk over your head. It doesn't really make right. you seem smarter. It is a default way a lot of people want to do things. Or maybe it's because in your environment, before you brought it to this meeting, that is all the acronyms you use. Mm -hmm. But you have to make sure you're in and evaluate your audience and make sure they all understand. Because everyone on the same page saves time. Once again, helps keep the meeting uh, shorter. Well, they brought you in to have that. You were brought in, where, whoever you are, you're brought into that meeting to explain something to people that don't know what you do. So if you talk over their heads, if you use acronyms, you're still explaining something to people that don't know what you do and they have no understanding of what you're still talking about. So I think it's important to, not, and I don't want to say dumb it down because they're, they're, we're all smart in our own respects. There's a lot of things Tom says. And I, <laughs> in, in the three months I spent with Tom um, in, in learning what, he, what Tom does, um, I learned a lot, but there were days I, things went over my head. And I'm smart in some ways. Tom's smart in others. He's the smartest man I know. And <laughs> you need and, to know more people, though. <laughs> no, I need to know. No, no. I, I, yeah. You, no, 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 no. You, you, I, I, but it, it, it seems that when, if you're running a meeting, especially if you're running the meeting and having to present the information, it's important to know your audience. Think yeah. about who that audience is. Do they understand that acronym? Do they understand what a firewall is? Are you going to have to have some things that you have to maybe send out before a meeting so, hey, this is the dictionary of terms I'm going to be using. I mean, it might be important to think and have forward thinking when you're going to lead a meeting to people who don't know what you're going to be talking about. Yeah, and this is all just effective stuff. Now, there's a couple of them here that are a little weird. Oh, let's um, see. Okay. Yeah, we'll, re we'll run through this other part of the list here, and it is uh, communicate directly with individuals rather than through chain of command. Any manager mm -hmm. enforcing chain of command rules – uh, communication will be fired. And I think that's kind of an interesting of, okay, we do have org charts, but I think there's something to be said for there's times when you got to bypass it. Mm -hmm. And I've run into this before because of where I was supposed to address problems and that person was not addressing it. Uh, and that person was very angry when I went around them. And there's times you have to, this is just, uh, the nature of it. We, we're given rules and guidelines, right. uh, as staff or employees, when you work somewhere, especially in IT, but there are times when you have that direct chain of command and they're just not listening to you. But be careful. If you're brand new there, it may not be the best thing to do, right, or maybe right. it will. But this is a careful territory where you tread because your inexperience may not uh, bode well for you. You may think you need to go over that person's head, but they actually do have a better understanding of it, and hopefully they convey that to you. So this is a tricky one. Um, it's hard. It's, it's a, not an easy one to navigate. You may instantly assume you know more, uh, but maybe you don't. That's, that's a back and forth. Right. That's a real... It can be the last time you work at a place because I've seen people <laughs> lose their jobs over. They went around their manager to, you know, complain about a problem that wasn't being resolved, but it turned out the manager had also expressed that. And they're like, you just broke chain of command. But it sounds like in mm. Elon at least values people who think that. And I think overall my success has been by going around and, of course, being right. Um, well, it's not breaking the chain of command <laughs> if you do it respectfully, right? Right. Um, I, I, I've had instances where I've had to go – where I, let's say I couldn't get in touch with my, my manager I was working with at the time, and there was something that was time sensitive. Um, wh where I was working, they believed in a flat leadership or supposed 
flat leadership that, you know, everyone had access to everybody open door policies. Beware of open door policies. I'm just going to be, yeah. be, be frank with that because that can bite you because what you say can and will be used against you uh, <laughs> in a corporate world. Yes, I, I, and very so, much so. So when you, if you do it respectfully, if you go and say, "Hey, I've talked with my 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 manager, my supervisor, and we had discussed this, but I wanted to come to you because I think we need to get this moving." Um, my manager has done some really good things to make you know. You never want to talk bad above you to the person between you. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, and I, that's a good rule: is uh, don't start out with my boss is an idiot while you're talking to their <laughs> boss. Uh, if you start with deprecating them, you start with uh, saying they don't know what they're doing. Right. You always come across like kind of, there, there's a perception that's going to be placed upon you by the person you're talking to. Like, mm-hmm. well, you first thing you said is they're an idiot. I hired them. So am I an idiot for hiring them? You may get some of that. You may get them to agree with you if they're really screwing up and they're doing something that would make a great Dilbert cartoon. But yeah. But either way, you ha- I always start with uh, talking very respectfully. I knew the person when I've done this before, when I worked at places, or even uh, we've. And he had a very similar incident from my business standpoint. Um, the owner hired a guy who we was supposed to be like the office manager. Um, there's no other way to, to say it. The guy was not smart <laughs> and caused a lot of chaos. Mm. And we had to very carefully talk to the owner going, this new guy, uh, he's making a lot of tech decisions for your company that are really bad. So we, and, uh, it did yeah. turn out though, because it turned out when we did talk to the CEO of the company, he, who was kind of an absent CEO for a while, which is why I hired this person. He wanted to work on another venture. Uh, he was having a lot of problems internally unrelated to technology. He goes, yeah, I think I'm going to fire him. Like, oh, okay, cool. We're all on the same page. Yeah, we're <laughs> We think you should fire him. We just didn't want to come out and start it as that, but his decisions are horrible. Um, and it turned out he had a lot of other management decisions, completely right. not tech related, that were also an equally horrible <laughs> and was causing him to lose untold monies. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny how some people get into a position because they were good at something below them. And yeah. so let's let them manage that process. And then they can't. Yeah. It turns um, out he was not cut out for leadership. Yeah. <laughs> and that happens. And, and, you know, and, and I think people above you, and I guess we're getting off the chain. Of, we're on, well, we're still on the chain. Yeah. People, people above you, if you're respectful and come to them and saying, Hey, this is what I'm seeing. Um, this might, it might be a, it, it'll bode better for you in the long run. Cause if you're looking to climb that chain of command as well and be, and climb that corporate ladder, it's not going to be in your best interest to start talking bad about people in between you and their, you know, the boss and boss and boss and going up that road. You want to be respectful because then they're going to look back at you and say, well, if he's, we, he's going to be that guy we want to lead our change or whatever it may right. be. Now, a couple of the next okay. ones I'll blend together as well. Uh, don't follow any company rule that doesn't make common sense. And ideas that in- increase productivity or happiness are always welcome. Now, those actually mm-hmm. resonate very well with me um, because I've had staff over my years in business argue with me about a policy or a methodology that I use to do something. But I'm always like, if there's a way you think is better, more efficient, let me know. I hear. Very... I heard you say that many times in mm-hmm. the three months I was here. Oh, yeah. If you have a better idea, please. I'm not I'm not the smartest guy in a room. I tell you, say it all the time. Uh, if there's a better way to do this, if there's a process you think is better, because a lot of what I do is, you know, as an owner of a business, you set up processes for people to follow. Yes. You set up procedures for them. I welcome them to – those that do the procedure are often best set to improve upon it, right, right. provided they're willing to think in an innovative manner. Now, I've had – Arguments from previous staff that no longer work here of just skipping things like documenting some of the process. Why do I have to document this? And I'm like, because you may not be the next person doing it. You know, those are some of the dumb arguments, but I've had other people that have brought efficiencies to the process. Mm-hmm. Um, I gave a lot of stuff. Steve handles a lot of the, I've let Steve write a lot of the processes for things. Um, the onboarding process for MSP stuff that we do has been dramatically reduced and made mm-hmm. easier by uh, Kyle, uh, because he writes a lot of scripts for things. So there's right. always like efficiencies brought to stuff. I'm like, awesome. It, it can makes two things happen. One, we're all happier because it mm-hmm. gets done faster and just rewrite the process. It's a really simple. We do a lot of our stuff in Google Docs. They edit the doc and the doc is now shorter, but still gets the job done. Awesome. Everybody wins. Everything efficiencies. Is efficiencies. It, it, it's funny. So I, it's for people out there that are leading people and you're wanting to build a process for something, how about let the person that's doing it build the process? Because I bet you you will be you'll be much 
in a much better position moving forward, letting the person that's actually doing it every day do it instead right. of somebody up here doing it. Yeah. So and that's the thing. So one, I'm good at it because I'm I'm a geek with my hands right. on the keyboard a lot. So I do know the process. And but letting them improve it, I've always uh, welcomed that as long as it brings more efficiencies, mm -hmm. as long as it doesn't uh, break any of the process, so things are still getting done. So right. that's one of those things. I'm not hard nosed about it, and as I've always disliked, because I found it very childish. People, uh, the we've always done it this way. That's why we do it this way. Well, that's not ever an answer you should have. There should be a reason for each step in the program. Right. If there's not a reason for that step, why are we doing it? And because we should, as frequently what I got when I worked at places, like, why are we adding this right here? We don't even use this anymore. And I never got good answers at some of the places mm -hmm. I worked. And uh, I was like, this is aggravating. And, you know, once again, it's something that will just end up in a Dilbert cartoon. <laughs> yes. Well, one thing you've done, Tom, though, is uh, and that I've seen in, in as long as I've known you, is that you're active in what you're doing. You don't, you don't just... You're not just you're you're onboarding people in the MSP space. You're doing some people come in. I've seen it. Mm -hmm. You're actually fixing the computer. You're doing some of the wiring and cable. You're doing. You can do every aspect, and you're not an absentee owner. No. You're there. I mean, yeah, you're doing these videos, but that's part of why you're you have the credibility because you're able to do everything within your business. Well, and, and this is something, I read Elon Musk's book too, and I, I've really admired uh, his management yes. style for this. Yes. So Elon Musk will be there. He takes the time to read the specs on, the. let's say, talk about SpaceX. Mm -hmm. He understands the specs and the details of the motors and the rocket engines they're building, which is incredibly uh, challenging. It's a lot of knowledge to have right there. Right. So he can have an intelligent meeting. Now, where do you provide value as a leader? So I have a lot of knowledge. Yes, I know how, and I'm, I'm admittedly bad at it, putting cable ends on and things like that, but I understand the infrastructure. Where I don't provide value is me punching down a hundred cables. Mm -hmm. As long as I know how they're punch down. I know where they need to go. Where the process is, is having one of my staff punch down the next 100 cables or the MSP process. Yeah, sure. I know how to run a check. I know how to mm -hmm. uh, do things in our dashboard, but doing it to the scale of how many computers we have in there, well, that's where you hire staff. I understand the structure. I, I've hands-on done Let's it. Let's face it. Kyle's going to do it faster than you anyways. Oh, eventually, yeah. <laughs> they, because they do it re and because they do it repeatedly, yeah. they do it faster. Uh, watching me kind of sometimes, because I'm not as familiar with the menus, especially because they just launched a new mm -hmm. thing that I have to check out. Yep. Um, my <laughs> staff was all excited about it yesterday. I didn't look at it, but it's a new back-end management system um, for managing computers. But once again, I understand mm -hmm. it. I've read through the, I do a lot of reading. So I've read through all the new features that are on here. I'm going to do some testing with it. So I have a good, clear understanding it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm going to talk to them about what processes are going to change. Not they have these features that add more value, right. you know, so I can have an intelligent uh, conversation with them. I am going to do some testing, but being that involvement allows the process uh, in having an understanding of it. That's just what works for mm -hmm. me. Absolutely. Oh, what, what do we got left on this list? And what we got left on here, um, I don't think this is relevant to small business, but uh, it is an interesting way it's worded. Contractors who can't find an employee to vouch for them will be fired. I think this is a problem when you scale up mm. a big company yeah. of you and you have a lot of contractors. Just making sure each contractor has an employee that understands what they're doing because um, when you work in a larger corporate environment, the uh, you end up having a budget and you're like, okay, I need this thing done, but I don't need a staff member because it's a temporary. I need a three mm -hmm. for the next three months. I need to write this code. I need a contractor who's really good at this yes. section of code writing, for example. So you bring in a contractor on there. But you as an employee, sometimes what happens is I'm busy doing my own things and I don't know what the programmer's doing now. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to vouch for what they're doing all the time. I think that's what he's referring to there. Right. Um, and I managed some programming teams and when I worked in corporate. You had to I'd, bring in contractors, didn't you, for that? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I brought absolutely. in a lot of contractors I managed. And that's that's still how I manage my business. So the scale and scope of my business, and uh, we, it's funny, we had a fun business conversation when we were on that uh, call. Yes. Because the person was talking about, well, how do you scale? You only have this many employees. Or how do you get these big projects done? I'm like, contract. Contract. Oh, I have a lot of relationships yeah. with other IT companies um, and contractors, and we farm out work all the time. Right. Uh, because man, managing day-to-day, -day, really easy when you have computers at scale. Mm -hmm. What about when I have to swap out 40, 50 computers at a time at one of my clients? Managing 40, 50 computers once they're installed, managing updates to a dashboard, click, click, click. That's easy. That doesn't take but a couple people. When someone goes, can you deploy all of these? Why well, bring in contractors? That's how I get. How did okay. you run, you know, a uh, hundred thousand square foot warehouse with three IDF rooms? Mm -hmm. You didn't do it with just Corey, right? No, we brought an entire team in an entire to make team. that happen. What was it nine people? We brought nine right. extra contractors right. to make that happen. Uh, that's a big part, but 
they can run away because you can assume they're doing their job and maybe they are, maybe they're not. Um, you kind of have to vouch for them. I think that's, that's the validation simple. portion of that where you got to be yeah. able to validate and vouch for what they're doing. Um, you got to know it. You were on that site a lot. Yeah. You and were... I was on that site visiting a lot because mm-hmm. there were problems and uh, not related to us, but related changes, change request orders yeah. that were coming through really fast. But this is that validating the contractors. Mm-hmm. I didn't just leave them to their own devices. Uh, the other thing, too, is there's contractors and there's subcontractors of those contractors. So there was there's a couple tiers down of different things mm-hmm. that can happen. So you have to make sure, you know, that everything's being done effectively. So it still requires some management um, because they're not like employees. So they do things their own style. They may not be aligned with the culture or rules because they're contractors. Uh, so you just right. have to make sure they're clear all the time what needs to be done. That's kind of probably what I'm assuming they mean by vouching for that. Well, and let's face it, if you're hiring contractors within a corporation and you're you're the lead for that, it's going to vote on you, who you are and what you are. So yeah, you have to be able to vouch for them. Um, very important. Very yeah. important. And number 11 is a thing we Gilbert. said first. Never <laughs> do anything to make a great Dilbert cartoon. And uh, that's just a good rule to start with mm-hmm. is think about, you know, how this plays out. Stay, take a step back. Is this a good meeting to have? And like we said at the very beginning. So that's, uh, if, yeah. I, I like, the, you remember <laughs> the office, right? Yeah. If it could be a scene in the office, oh, yeah. don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> it's actually, you know, that's fun. And if you haven't watched um, Office Space, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's such a oh, classic. Where's the it, red stapler? Yeah. Well, and it's funny because, um, oh, what's his name that wrote The Office Space? His name eludes me right now. Uh, Mike Judge. Yeah. And he worked in corporate. Read his background. Mm-hmm. Of course, if you haven't seen Silicon Valley, same thing. He got that because he's worked and lived in Silicon Valley. Right. And those jokes are so based in reality. It's just like the Dilbert Absolutely. cartoon. It's not, th- it's not that someone had to spend a lot of time creatively thinking about it. They just had to spend some time in corporate America and watch, <coughs> watch the th- dumb things happen. <laughs> right. And, 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 but the, the problem is people, scripts and movies and, and cartoons mm-hmm. get written because of reality. Yeah. There's a lot of reality that this is all based on. Matter yeah. of fact, uh, if you don't know, if, if you're a fan like I am of Silicon Valley, uh, the HBO mm-hmm. show, a lot of it, if you look at who some of the writers are, some of them have worked in, I think, some of the venture capital world and things like that. They're they're not writers. They're going, oh, we just want to write about what happened. When they're we telling a story of what really happened is what they're doing. Yeah. If you watch some of these documentaries about some of these Silicon mm-hmm. Valley startups, they're ridiculous. You can't believe some of the stupid that happened. Like, who gave these people? I sometimes face palm when I read this because uh, they're... I think someone called it kick farted or something like that. So it's Kickstarter. So I, how can you give these people this much money to do dumb things? Right. Um, you know, there's all kinds of stories like that. And just like someone got excited and gave a bunch of funding to mm-hmm. it, but it made, there's just, there's no product there. Like how did, you know, and of course I watched the Theranos documentary. Uh, if you haven't watched that, I have not, you I'm really not. should. It's uh, called Theranos out for blood. And yeah. uh, it is, deep and dark because you can't believe so much funding was given to someone who didn't even have a viable product at all that was not based on any type of reality you're just like what and we, we think what could we do with that fund? what we could have we have done with that funding ourselves i mean yeah think what you could have done yeah <laughs> they were given so much money and so many lies were told and uh but wow. how would people kept believing them i mean it, it's more of a story of fraud mm-hmm. uh it's it's basically a uh vc version uh venture capital and tech version of the fire yeah don't use <laughs> the acronyms. fire party <laughs> 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 so uh, but it's one of those things like you know think about all that stuff that comes to reality right, so right. we'll quit babbling on about this and uh, i'll leave links to some of the other business talks we do let me know what else you want to hear because i've had some requests for more business talks and uh brett happened to be in the area today so we recorded this one but i'll leave your thoughts below or continue discussion and forums on this, um, you know, maybe even share some of your Dilbert moments that you've had yes. if you work in corporate, because I know at least uh, quite a handful of you do uh, that watch these. So hopefully this is helpful. Uh, maybe it'll get you out of a meeting or two, uh, gracefully and tastefully out yes. of a meeting. <laughs> so, gracefully, respectfully. Uh, if you, I'll leave a link to Chittum Consulting. Uh, Brett right. does business consulting and maybe can help you have more effective meetings. I'll leave a link to his website. And of course, uh, there's always a link to my website and all the fun things that you can hire us for related technology. This is the man right here. <laughs> We, our focus is more on the technology. He focuses on some of the business coaching. All right, thanks. Have a good one. <laughs> thanks for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to subscribe to this channel to see more content, hit that subscribe button and the bell icon, and maybe YouTube will send you a notice when we post. If you want to hire us for a project that you've seen or discussed in this video, head over to lawrencesystems.com where we offer both uh, business IT services and consulting services and are excited to help you with whatever project you want to throw at us. 
Also, if you want to carry on the discussion further, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can keep the conversation going. And if you want to help the channel out in other ways, we offer affiliate links below, which offer discounts for you and a small cut for us that does help fund this channel. And once again, thanks again for watching this video and see you on next time.